Hey folks, how you doing? Hopefully you're all having a great day today. This is going to be a discussion on shop safety. And anytime there's a discussion involved with me, I tend to ramble. So I've got a long outline, about two pages, small font, lots of stuff to cover. As you can see right here, got a bunch of stuff on my workbench or assembly table. When it comes to shop safety, it's not just PPE, personal protective equipment. There's a bunch of stuff behind me that is mostly PPE, but we're also going to talk about some other shop related stuff fire safety, uh, fire prevention, egress, stuff like that. Uh, anyway, before I get into my outline, because I am, I guess, rambling right here, uh, I've, I've got two quotes or two sayings that kind of resonate with me and that I'd like to give to all of you and see what you guys think. So the first one is something that was told in, or I heard in junior high, it was seventh or eighth grade shop class. I forget which uh, year it was. And that is a clean shop is a safe shop. And if you recall, some of you who've been watching these videos for a little while, uh, back in my apartment shop, as well as the first half, I guess, of the two-car garage shop, I had a white dry erase board, and I had on the top of it a clean shop is a safe shop. And that kind of resonated with me, uh, for, and it still does. I, I like that saying because, well, first off, it's kind of a loaded saying, right? There's, there's a lot that goes into whether a shop is or isn't safe. The way I see that saying is that stay a little bit more organized, stay a little bit tidy. You're going to be less frustrated. You're going to be, you know, sorting through stuff, trying to find, you're going to be less frustrated, less chances of making some stupid frustration error. And then also, uh, a clean shop is a safe shop. The floors. I can't stand stuff all over the floor, primarily sawdust. What do we do? We make sawdust, we make chips, we make shavings, dust. It gets everywhere. So every now and then, I like to sweep up and clean up the floor. It only takes just a few seconds, especially if you have a, a convenient way to do it. And keeping the floors nice and tidy prevents slipping. In my first shop that I showed on these videos, it was an apartment. Right, I was maintenance on an apartment complex and had ceramic tile floor. Sawdust on top of the ceramic tile was just brutal. You slide all over the place. So keep the floors clean in there. My second shop uh, was a two car garage. The concrete was really, really rough. Slipping wasn't really a concern, but it was still annoying to get sawdust all into my shoes and all over the place. And then you take it inside the house. That's, that's kind of a different point. Here in this shop, whoever built this, this shop, this structure, did a really good job on the floor. The concrete is nice and sealed, it's nice and smooth, uh, and therefore it's slippery when sawdust gets built up all over the place. So in here, uh, I've made some provisions or I've taken some steps to make it really, really easy to clean the floor. I have a dust mop in here that I just pull around the shop and I have a floor sweep attached to my dust collection system. It's very, very convenient. And with anything in the shop, if you make it convenient, you're gonna use it. You're gonna take advantage of it a lot more often. So a clean shop is a safe shop, kind of a loaded statement there, but to me, it just means Keep a little tidy organization when you're working and also keep the floors clean. So what does it mean to you? Uh, the second thing that really stands out to me, you can hold stuff with a wooden hand, you can walk on a wooden leg, but you can't see with a wooden eye. So wear your safety glasses. I have contacts, I've got horrible eyes, I wear contacts all the time. So for me, putting on eye protection is, is second nature. I just don't like not having eye protection on when I'm working with tools, just because getting dust in your eyes is brutal regardless. But when you have contacts, it just, it just, uh, no, not gonna do it. So wear, wear eye protection. Also, I do have one kind of almost horror story related with, related to the eyes. So back before, see, I was still in, I think I was still in high school. Uh, I was working with my uncle helping build his house. One of the things that, I mean, he kind of let me have free range to do whatever, right? He didn't, he didn't baby the situation. I learned a lot by screwing up working with him. And I was using a framing nail gun, right? Big nails and shooting the bottom side of a sill or uh, shooting, shooting something up to the bottom side of something. I forget exactly what it was, but no eye protection, big gun, air powered. And as I pushed the gun up, I'm using bump fire technique, the nail came out of the side of the, the piece of wood that I was nailing to, and it bent the, the nail while it shot right through and curved and kept spinning and whacked me right on my right eyebrow. And I had a big scar, or not scar, but a big bruise, the shape of the nail down into my eye. It kind of hurt, uh, but that bruise stuck with me for a little while. Luckily, no skin was broken. It was just an impact wound. Uh, just a smack to the face, but holy smokes, wear eye protection. That's the second little saying that uh, has, has really always stuck with me about eye protection. You can, you can hold stuff with a wooden hand, you can walk on a wooden leg, but you can't see with a wooden eye. 
protect your eyes. I have a, I don't know if I said this, maybe I have, I have a long outline, a lot of stuff to get through. So first thing on my outline is disclaimer. <laughs> I'm not an expert in the field of safety. I'm not a medical personnel, personal, I'm not a medical professional. Uh, so just take this, this video, this information here, kind of like a, with a grain of salt, right? The, the point of this video is not to be like concrete factual evidence and instruction, but rather a discussion. Next up is what are my goals with this video? It's got three, thing, three things. <laughs> Maybe you have some advice that you would like to input to the conversation. I want this to be a conversation. If you're watching this on any one of the video platforms, leave a comment. You can always leave a comment no matter where you are. If you're watching this on my website, leave a comment. Oftentimes you'll scroll through the comments on certain videos and you'll find a little gem that was provided by the community, like, oh, I, I never thought of that. So leave a comment, you never know, you could help somebody, could potentially change someone's life, that's really cool. The second thing, maybe something in this video that I'm presenting will be beneficial to somebody else, that would be really cool. And the third goal is to give myself kind of an audit of what I have going on here, ways that I can improve. And spoiler alert, the last thing on my outline is areas for improvement, because as I was making this outline, there's four things that just stuck out to me, like, hey buddy, you gotta implement these. So that's that. Uh, next up, resources slash my perspective. So my perspective, I've been doing woodworking, you know, professionally. I say professionally because what I do is I create content for my website and uh, video form and article form, but the content is all woodworking based. So I'm not, I'm not this isn't a, uh, you know, a, a mass production type facility. I'm, this is not a commercial teaching environment of woodworking, but I am documenting my journey and doing woodworking all the time. So there's my perspective on this safety stuff. I've also done a tremendous amount of research and hopefully can convey some of that research to all of you guys out there. I also have a little bit of experience with one, one kind of like general health and safety thing, not necessarily woodworking specific, but in college I took a, I think it was health one. It was a full semester of basically like good first aid and we all got CPR certified and it was, it was a good eye-opening class. I uh, learned a lot from that class. Of course, that's, that was a decade ago, so I could probably benefit from a re refresher course. I know I can, really. Uh, but that was a really good eye-opener on, on some general safety stuff, not necessarily just in this shop, but if, you know, if you're driving down the road and you happen to witness an accident, you could potentially help. That's really cool to have that little skill set, and it's something that I will always recommend people to, to do a little personal growth in the, the health and safety type of stuff. So if you're interested in taking like a CPR course or a first aid course, something like that, there's a, uh, there's a site on page on the red, redcross.org and I'll have it linked in the description here uh, or you can put in your location and see the courses that are offered, offered in your area, which is really cool. Some more resources here. So this video, I want to be like, like I said, a, a resource or a community effort here. I want to have a place that I can point people to uh, for a lot of safety type of stuff. Uh, but it's not just my type of, it's not just this particular video. Uh, I've got a couple of videos that I'm going to link down below to some other uh, woodworking channels on YouTube that have done really good videos on safety and first aids, that type of stuff. And also there's a really good article. It was in Fine Woodworking and it's called Cutting Edge First Aid by Patrick Sullivan a former ER doctor and this is a this one I printed off was in PDF format it was emailed to me by a couple different people and I thought wow there's there's a tremendous amount of really good information in here and I'd love to be able to provide this as a link to all of you guys out there however it is from fine woodworking I looked it up online trying to find this article and this article is in their members only section so whoever sent this to me kind of um, wasn't supposed to I guess and I don't really want to step on anyone's toes as far as copyright and all that crap. So I emailed Fine Woodworking and hopefully by the time I publish this video back, they have responded either just giving me permission or not as far as providing all this to all of you guys out there. I hope they do because it's, it's really full of really good stuff. And I do want to say one little thing out of here, just one little quick tip. It's, it's a mini page article, but there's one little quick tip, just a little teaser I want to throw out there. Something that I never thought of that was it actually makes a lot of sense. It says, when you cannot stop working, use a glove. If you get a minor cut, say while you're in the middle of a glue up, you don't have to stop working, put on an examination glove or a, a sterile glove and wrap masking tape snugly around the finger directly over the cut. The glove keeps the blood off the woodwork and the pressure from the tape will usually stop the bleeding in five to 10 minutes. After removing the tape and glove, wash your hands thoroughly and close and dress the wound. 
quick little tip. I never thought about using a glove, but yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Glove it, tape it, go back to work. And you see a lot of people like uh, myself included, when you're working with, you just throw a little piece of, you know, uh, paper towel on there and, and, and electrical tape it. You got this big old, anyway, using a glove is a much better tip. There's a lot of really cool stuff in here that I hope I can share with you guys. So I'll have these resources linked in the description. Uh, next up, I'm going to just run through some PPE type stuff. I've tried a lot of PPE, personal protective equipment, and that means eyes, ears, skin, and lungs, right? Personal protective equipment in regards to woodworking, right? Uh, not only have I tried a lot, but I try to keep a lot of extras on hand because while this isn't a commercial teaching facility, there's a lot of people who walk through that door on a regular basis with no woodworking experience, and I walk them through bit making stuff. I absolutely love in-person type of instruction and, and teaching people and, and watching somebody else get that satisfaction of making stuff. It's just so cool. Uh, so there's a lot of people that come through here and their safety is just as important as my safety, right? So I want to have a bunch of options for other people to try and see what fits them the best. And also just uh, having a lot of redundancy and a lot of uh, multiples of PPE allows for multiple people to be in here working at once. For example, last weekend, maybe two weekends ago, something like that, uh, my wife's cousin came over for three days, 16 year old kid, really good kid, learned a lot in those three days, impressed me quite a bit as far as his uh, quick learning ability. Uh, but we made four projects in three days. He enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It was a really cool time. Two days prior to him coming was when a whole bunch of my family left. I had my dad, two sisters, and three nephews all in the, pl all in the shop. And they were here for about a week. Every single day that they were here, we were all here in the shop. Well, that's a lot of people and everybody has to have eyes and ears, right? Everyone has to have hearing protection. Everyone has to have uh, safety glasses going if they're anywhere remotely close to the tools. Having a lot of stuff to pass out and, and for them to choose from uh, is, you know, really good. I, I like to keep a lot of stuff on hand. So uh, for that reason, I've tried a lot of stuff and I've got some thumbs up and I've got some thumbs down. So I'm going to run through all these. Hopefully this doesn't get too long. First up with eyes, uh, eye protection, safety glasses. So like I said, I've got a bunch to choose from. And first off, the ones that get a thumbs down, right? So these are some cheapos off of Amazon. You can get, I think like a pack of 20 of these for like $15, something like that. They're really, really inexpensive. And if you're just, you know, if you're in a pinch and you just need something, well, they're better than nothing. But if you're doing this all the time, these are not something that I would recommend because they're not really comfortable. They're, there's not much flex in these. They're pretty, pretty stiff and they're, uh, the shape is kind of generic that basically everybody that I've given these two to use, they don't fit that great. And because they are so stiff and they don't, uh, they don't kind of bend that well, they get inside my hat and sometimes they'll wiggle around when my hat moves and not, there, there you go, right there. They don't sit right. Anyway, these are good to keep on hand just for extras, but just for a daily driver, kind of a thumbs down. Not that great. Next up is the Harbor Freight ones. Everything's inexpensive at Harbor Freight, and uh, there's, there's a lot of really good disposables, consumables, I guess is the better word, uh, that Harbor Freight has, like their gloves. Um, but I tried their safety glasses. I don't like them at all. The, this, this center section, I thought, well, that's a padding, right? Well, it's not much padding at all. There's, I thought there was padding back here behind the ears, not much padding at all. And, uh, they fit funky. They fit way high on the bridge of my nose. So I feel like there's a big gap here. This doesn't seal off hardly at all. I just don't feel like my eyes are really protected wearing these particular safety glasses. So these thumbs down for me and everybody that I've had in the shop doesn't like these. So again, these are good to, you know, don't throw them away, but uh, I wouldn't go out and purchase these again. Getting into the ones that I actually like. These are the 3M Virtua. I think that's what they are. Virtua. They're written right here. 3M Virtua CCS. Now the CCS, I don't know what it stands for, but I think uh, they mention that in relation to these clips right here. And there's, they've got some slots in here to, uh, if you have like those lanyard style earplugs they can feed into the safety glasses that way when you take these off your earplugs come out and it just kind of rests with you and you you don't really have to uh put your safety glasses down anywhere it just kind of stays with you so i think that's what the ccs is related to they come with a foam gasket these are like less than 10 bucks and are really really good safety glasses i think these are definitely deserve a thumbs up but this foam gasket 
Never use it. I, I don't like it. These are supposedly anti-fog, but they do fog up if you sweat a lot outside in this really humid environment like it is here in Mississippi. And those, those uh, foam gaskets, in my opinion, make it even worse. So I throw those out. And this is the safety glasses style that I've been rocking for like, I don't know, three or four years now, something like that. These, these fit wonderfully. They fit great. Not only do they fit good, they do, they're a little bit bulky. So when you have like earmuff style hearing protection, you know, it's, it's kind of bulky right here. Uh, but I feel like I've got a really good connection all the way around my face. They, f they fit my face really, really well. Not just my face. Everyone that has tried these said that these are really nice safety glasses. Uh, they just fit really, really good. Definitely a thumbs up with these. They're like 10 bucks, less than 10 bucks on Amazon. So years ago when I, when I found these and I stumbled upon them, and I thought, wow, these fit really comfortable. There, there's got to be a tinted version of these. And the reason why I searched for that is because any sunglasses that I, I pick up, or I, I don't like to spend a lot of money on sunglasses. I know there's a whole industry for like two and $300 sunglasses. Not me. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't spend $25 on sunglasses. Uh, so these fit really, really well. Do they make a tinted version that I could use as sunglasses? Because I know that these fit. I love the way that they fit. And yes, they do. For about this, I think this is the same exact price. You can get a tinted version. So uh, I bought two or three sets of these for my shop and they've lasted many years. They work really, really well. And I bought about 10 or 15 of the tinted version for outside scattered throughout because I wear contacts. My eyes are extremely sensitive to light. I don't like to drive in the summertime or anytime rather with a sun when it's sunny. I don't like to drive without sunglasses. It's, it's just brutal on my eyes. I got to squint real, real bad. So I like to have um, backups, right? My wife's in the military and there's a military saying three is two, two is one, one is none. So if you only have one, and something happens to it or you lose it, you really have none. So you have to have a backup. You have to have contingency plans. I find it to be a, a good motto to live by for most things. Uh, anyway, I don't know where I was going with that. So I keep two or three pairs in my truck, two or three pairs in my wife's vehicle. I've got a couple of these scattered throughout the house and, and here in the shop. I've got a bunch of these and everyone who's come over or you know is driving in the truck with me and oh man, I forgot my sunglasses. Here, try these on. They love them and I'm like, take them with you. You can have them. So it's pretty cool to you know be able to give these out occasionally too. So anyway, really, really good sunglasses and they're still safety glasses. So you can use these like mowing the yard using a, a string trimmer. Still have your eyes protected and not worry about stuff shattering through just generic safety glasses. These work really, really well. So fast forward a little bit to somewhat recently. I was basically, I was, I was told about a new style of the same brand 3M safety glasses. These are, these are the 3M Secure Fit and they're very similar to the other ones, but they're a little bit more comfortable. So they've got this in the middle they have this flexible silicone thingy uh, that you can squeeze up or down to fit your nose. And they fit really well. Good seal, good coverage all the way around. Uh, but the cool thing about these is these are a little bit better than the last pair I showed if you have over the ear earmuffs because uh, the banding or whatever this is, the, the arm that goes behind your ear on the last ones was a little bit thick. So if you put your uh, your your earmuffs on it doesn't get that good of a seal. Well, these are not only super thin, right? There's like nothing to them, but they're super flexible. So this is like the much better version of the super cheap ones on Amazon. Amazon. Uh, I recently got these, and these are my go-to now. And the best part is these are so cheap. These are the the last ones that I really give a good thumbs up to. These Virtuas. These are right under ten dollars each, if I'm not mistaken. These are like three bucks. So super cheap, which means you can get more of them and not worry about one being scratched up and having to live with a stupid scratch right in your vision, which is, we all know is super annoying. My only complaint with these, I still give them a big thumbs up. My only complaint is because these are so flexible, it's, it's kind of difficult to get them on one handed. So if you got something in your hand, open up, come on. There we go. It's kind of difficult to get them going on one handed which in the shop, generally not that big of a deal. You always put some stuff down, but just like the uh, last pair, I wanted a tinted version <laughs> to uh, drive around with because these are, again, super, super, super cheap. 
I do not care if I abuse these and scratch them up for a $3 pair of sunglasses uh, that are safety glasses too. These just work really, really well and I like it. So the only, like I said, downside is this being so flimsy that it's difficult to get on one handed, which for example, if I'm leaving the grocery store and I have a couple bags of groceries in my hands, I'll typically put these up on top of my hat. My microphone's up there, I don't wanna bump it. But I'll typically put it on top of my hat when I go into a building and when you get ready to leave, right? You gotta bag your handful of something and then trying to get these on one handed. It's doable, but it's kind of a pain in the butt. Not anywhere near as easy as, as these that are just automatically open, right? They stay open quite a bit. So these are much easier to get on one handed. So that's, I figured that was worth mentioning, the little details, right? Still give these a huge thumbs up. Both of these are, are basically my go-to style now. I think these are uh, such a good value for the price. They're stupid cheap and they do a good job. Now, as far as somebody who likes super dark sunglasses, I will say that the, the Virtuas are just a touch darker and tinted a little more towards yellowish. These are a touch lighter tinted a little bit more towards blue. So if that matters, I don't know. I still like, doesn't matter which one I'll grab. Whichever one I see first, I'm gonna grab. They both do a good job. I think that's it for safety glasses. No, it's not. Uh, there's one thing that I did, men did not mention and I don't have with me right here. Inside that drawer, that middle drawer over there is my safety and PPE drawer. I do have a set of goggles with a strap around the back. So if somebody comes in here with real thin glasses that are not safety glasses and your eyes are nowhere near protected, well, sorry, but you gotta put the goggles over those safety, over those regular glasses. So think about that too. If someone has non-safety prescription glasses that they have to wear, well, you, you still gotta protect around your eyes. I, in my opinion, you still gotta protect around your eyes for debris coming up at your face. Next on the list is ear, uh, hearing protection. And there's a couple of different kinds. There's in the ear, there's over the ear, there's with Bluetooth and audio connectivity and without, right? And I've gone back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, but ultimately at the end of the day, where I'm at in my life right now, the most sound reduction, the better. Uh, sounds, noises, I don't know if it's being around tools for so long, but man, loud noises just start to give me a headache and I, and I like quiet. I don't like to hear the, the loud noise constantly. Uh, so good hearing protection uh, to me will trump the features, right? I would, I would prefer better hearing protection versus features. So just to run through all the stuff that I've tried right out of, right when I started this woodworking hobby, I guess, I was still really very familiar and very close to some industrial working experience that I had. And I worked in a frame mill at Ashley Furniture. There's large CNC machines going. There's a constant dust collection system going, large band saws. It was a loud environment. So of course you're required to wear hearing protection. They provided these kind of disposable in the ear uh, style hearing protection that I'm sure everyone is familiar with, right? These little foam plugs that you squeeze down and get real small and tiny, stick it in your ear and it expands. These are super, super cheap. Uh, this box, as it says, 50 pairs. I bought this many, many years ago and I've, I think I've got about 15 or 20 pair left. I kind of tried to stretch them out as far as I could, as far as the use. Uh, just being a cheapskate at the time. These have a 29 decibel noise reduction rating, which is good, but there's better. So I, I rocked these for a little while, and then I thought, man, I wanted to quiet down just a little bit more than that. Still have those. So I got these, which have a 32 noise reduction rating. Uh, they aren't individually wrapped, which is a little bit more convenient to just grab a couple out of this little container. But as you can see, I didn't use that many out of them. I think other people who have come to the shop have used more than I have out of this pack because shortly after that, sometime in the two car garage shop, I think that was the shop, I found this pair, which I really loved for a long time. This is the Howard Light brand. I don't know the, the sound decibel rating. I don't know what these are rated at. I'll probably look it up and put it on the screen. If not, then just call me lazy because it's not there. <laughs> anyway, this one has a, this one has speakers inside. So there's a three and a half millimeter headphone jack or a auxiliary cable jack. And you can see all kinds of crap around it. I had to super glue the adapter that I had. The adapter was wore out and it was falling out. And this was the only use that I had for it was this. So I, had to, I ended up super gluing in it and it worked for a little while. And, and yeah, I shouldn't have done that. But I used a little three and a half millimeter male to male uh, adapter. 
and used a little Bluetooth dongle. If you look at some of my earlier videos in the apartment, sh not the apartment, the two-car garage shop, uh, this was the primary pair that I wore for a long, long, long time. Uh, over the years, this padding has become like a rock. I guess I could replace these. I just haven't had, I just haven't put the effort into replacing these. Um, and because it's like a rock, it stopped kind of sealing around my hat and around my hearing, or my eye protection. So I looked for something different. I still keep these as a backup, you know, for somebody else who comes in the shop who's maybe not wearing a hat uh, and for whatever they're doing doesn't necessarily require safety glasses or if they're using uh, these secure fit safety glasses, which are super, super thin. I'll still let them wear these. Maybe I should still replace the little foam pad just to keep them on hand. Anyway, so I wore these for a long time. I still probably give them a thumbs up. After that, I got a couple of these Western Safety brand from Harbor Freight just because they're cheap. It's, it's good to have a couple extras on hand. However, they're small. There's not much distance here. This is extended all the way out as much as it can on this little adjustment. And even with my hat on, or with my hat on, I have to put the, the strap on top all the way to the back in order for it to cover my ears. Like it won't, it won't go on the top of my head just because, I don't know, maybe I have a big head, maybe my hat and hair take up too much space. Uh, but that's definitely something to consider. These won't fit on your head if uh, you got a lot of hair or wear a hat or whatever. So these ended up not being great for adults, but really good for children. So I got a couple of these on hand that I keep here in the shop uh, as well. These are super cheap. The ultimate, the best, right? These are the best over the ear earmuffs that I've ever tried. Everybody who's come into my shop and use them have used multiples agrees. If somebody like uh, a friend of mine who, who visits the shop frequently, if he goes to reach for a pair of hearing protection, I've got all, all of these on a rack. This is the ones that they always grab. This is 3M Optime 105. They've got a really good noise reduction rating. And the padding here is super soft. See that? Super soft. So it conforms around uh, all of the PPE, the, the, the safety glasses. And of course, if you're wearing a hat, it'll, it'll conform around it quite well. And there's enough space on top to where it can go on top of your head where they're supposed to be worn. Uh, these are really, really nice. I have uh, two pair here in the shop, and I also keep one pair in my shooting range bag. So these are really, really good, and I want to keep one of these as a backup for other stuff outside of the shop. Everybody really likes these. So then I went through this, you know, this uh, this time where I was like, man, I want to have, I want to listen to some tunes in my ears. I barely ever listen to music, but I just wanted to start listening to some music at, during some long milling sessions or something like that, where it doesn't affect the audio on the video, so I don't get like a copyright strike. So. I want to go back to some type of Bluetooth stuff. By the way, these big thumbs up. Definitely recommend these. So I went to back to the in the ear style for for Bluetooth, some MP3 stuff. I used the I don't have them with me. I gave them away. The I bought a set of the the ISO tunes, the the first one, the big bulky orange ones. I bought a set of those and they hurt the inside of my ear. Maybe my ears shaped funny. I don't know. They they just weren't for me. They worked pretty good, but the, the fit wasn't for me. So I gave them those away. So, and I think a lot of users had that same complaint, which is one of the reasons why they came out with their new set. But I haven't, I never tried the new set. Instead, I bought one of these because they're a lot cheaper. This is the Elgin Ruckus MP3. So your volume control over here is standard, just like the majority of the other ones. And they're the silicone plugs that go in your ear. And what's good about these is the band right there. Uh, as you drop it, it doesn't want to fall off. There's an extra little thickness to this part of the band. And these worked good. These were, again, my go-to for a little while because I could wear, they were super convenient. They never fall off in this orientation. They never fall off my body. They're always right here, ready to go. And the music was good. The sound quality is good, good enough. I don't really care too much about sound quality. The problem with these was I started to realize after a while, like, is the hearing protection really good? I was like, are these really decent noise reduction rating. So let me just buy another El Cheapo set of plugs just to compare them with, right? Because I know they don't, they're not as good as the silicone ones are not as good as the foam ones. So is there another set that is even better hearing protection? So then I bought a pack of these El Cheapos silicone without Bluetooth. Uh, these had a better noise reduction rating, if I'm not mistaken. Again, they go over your neck, uh, much shorter than the first ones, but these had a little bit better actual noise reduction than these. So then I got started wearing these again. And I had a bunch of extras that you give out as well because these are super cheap. And then I thought, well, can you get better than these? Might as well just find something that has a lanyard that's the best. The 
lanyard, is this a lanyard, cord, whatever you want to call it, I'll say cord, lanyard, corded, but the foam. So this is the best of the best as far as hearing protection in the ear. Foam hearing protection is going to be the best noise reduction rating uh, versus silicone, and then having the lanyard so you don't lose them. So there you go. This is my recommended, if you just, if you just want good hearing protection, but you want it on a lanyard so you don't lose it, uh, it's this particular style. So these are super cheap. You can get a box of 50 or 20 or buy them individually, box of 10. You can get, you get them in various different sizes, uh, various different quantities, uh, and they last a decent amount of time so long as your fingers stay clean. The only downside with, with these is they're not super fast, right? If I just need to make a couple quick cuts, it's gonna take a, a minute or two, a couple minutes to squeeze this down, stick it in my ear, wait for it to expand up. So I'll wear these. These are my preferred hearing protection overall if I'm gonna be in here for a while, if I'm gonna be cutting stuff for a while. But if I just need to make one or two cuts, it's these. I'm not gonna wear these for long extended periods of times because you do have this pressure under your head and I don't particularly care for that. So. There you go. Hopefully some of that information was useful with the hearing protection. I think I rambled once again. Best earmuffs, best earplugs, super cheap, reasonably priced. It's also worth noting that uh, my daughter has hearing protection as well. Aren't these so cute? My, my a friend of mine sent these to me, uh, sent these to her, right? Sent these to Tyler. So she has her own hearing protection. She has a matching set of pink safety glasses and she hasn't quite got the concept of why these are necessary and all that stuff, but it's so cool. She loves putting them on and just walking around in the shop for no reason. And she loves putting them on her ear and taking them off, putting out, you know, hearing the sound difference, right? So cool. Anyway, protect the kiddos ears too. Next up on the list is your skin. Protect your skin from stuff. And the first thing that we think of is chemicals, right? Finishes. Protect yourself, your skin from finishes and chemicals. Uh, but there's a little bit more to it than that. And keep in mind with like safety advice, everyone's safety is going to be tweaked to them and their personal stuff. So most of the general safety ideas are pretty good for everybody, but there's some little caveats and some little things that uh, don't kind of apply to everybody. For example, there's some personal preference when holding stuff at the router table. There's a lot of people that absolutely swear by and recommend and you must use push pads at the router table. Push pads to keep your hands away from the spinning bit. Well, that sounds great. You know, it's a, it's a device to keep your hands away from a spinning bit. To me, I find it to be more dangerous using push pads at a router table. Uh, there's, there's, they're awkward, it's clumsy. Sometimes the padding on the bottom of it is not grippy and they slide and there's a, there's a physical disconnect from the work that's actually being done. So for me, that's, that sounds like great safety advice, but for me, it's, it's not good safety advice. I do not like using push pads at the router table because I have a physical disconnect from the work that's going on and I don't feel safe doing that. I don't have good control over the material. Uh, that's just generally speaking for me. Sometimes with very small pieces, I will use a push pad if they're super small because it offers greater control. But as a general rule, that general rule doesn't apply to me And if, as far as I feel safe doing something. So that, I bring that up to be, because gloves, right? Uh, when you think of gloves and protecting your skin, you think about finishes, but I also use them for adding grip to certain tasks. So this particular glove is, uh, these are the AMMEX Glove Works HD Green, the green, orange, whatever. Now, of course, I'm making this video during the whole COVID thing, so gloves are basically super hard to find, but when everything gets back to uh, normal supply levels, definitely recommend getting a, a, a box of these. These are just the normal, inexpensive, protective nitrile, nitrile gloves, but as you can see, they have grippies, little triangles all over the place. And these actually provide a lot of grip. So a lot of people have sent me questions about some of these green gloves that I'm using at the jointer or uh, mainly the jointer. Uh, and that's that's what these are. So when I'm jointing a board, uh, sometimes I feel like I'm, I don't really have that much grip on them, especially if I have dry hands in the winter time or if the board has already surfaced a little bit and it loses that rough sawn texture and it's a nice smooth surface that comes off the machine, uh, you lose a little bit of that grip. You don't want to have your hands slipping at any tools. So this one in particular, the jointer, I sometimes wear these gloves. And then anytime you wear a glove on a, near a power tool, you always get the immediate gloves are dangerous at power tools. You should stop doing that. You're going to kill yourself, right? You're going to cut off a limb or something like that. And you have, you have to take that with a grain of salt too. The primary reason for not wearing gloves is the big padded ones or the thicker ones because they'll get caught into the machines. This is super thin. This is just like 
Uh, this is gonna rip just like skin. So if this gets caught in the machine, A, I'm way too close to the spinning blade, or I'm doing something wrong, and B, with this glove there or not there, the result is gonna be the same. So kind of take that safety advice that you see floating around on the internet, including everything in this video, with a little bit of, you know, little grain of salt or whatever. Next on the list is lungs, and this is the last PPE section, lungs, right? So you wanna protect your lungs. Uh, woodworking dust is dangerous, not the stuff that you actually see. The stuff you see is just a nuisance. It's just in your way, it's dirty. You wanna just clean it up kind of stuff. The stuff that's really, really harmful is the super small fine particles that are suspended in the air, the stuff that your lungs cannot filter out. For that, there's two different things that you can do, two general solutions, either collect it at the source or prevent it from getting into your body so collecting it at the source is going to have the biggest global impact on your environment the more dust you can get at the source the less of obviously that's just going to be floating around in the air which is why i've invested a lot of time and energy into creating a nice dust collection system here in the shop i've, I've taken uh, some steps to make sure all these tools do good a job as I can think of to uh, collect dust at the source. Now, is it perfect? No, it's not perfect. There's still dust here and there everywhere. Uh, all these tools still produce dust that you can physically see or you can actually see in the shop. But like I said, it's the stuff that you can't see that's 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 the real dangerous stuff. So a couple things that I've done, and I, I don't want this section to be like, hey, spend a lot of money on a big, powerful dust collection system. That's, that's unrealistic advice. There's a couple other things you can do. You can clean the air that, you, that you're actually breathing, uh, just an ambient air cleaner. They're, they make, they make uh, manufactured units that you can just purchase and hang up somewhere. Uh, I don't recommend going that route. I recommend building your own out of a squirrel cage type blower from like an old furnace. So if you haven't seen my video on my air cleaner cart, I'll have that linked down in the resources down below. Check it out. It's a very inexpensive build. I've built three of them, as a matter of fact, uh, for two for other people's shops. The second and third one only took like a half hour to build because I've already built it once and it's just a few parts. The biggest thing is to source the actual blower motor. And if you talk to any local contractor, HVAC contractors, they will generally have either one that they can give you or for a really discounted price, a uh, used one that they'll pull out of an old unit that they're uh, replacing. So it's just a squirrel cage style blower. Um, my air cleaner cart, it sits on a plywood base. There's four walls directly around it with four filters, 20 inch by 20 inch filters. It sucks air in, blows it out the bottom. That's all it does. But one of the things that I, one of the reasons why I know my air cleaner cart is super effective is because I test it with that right there. It's a Dylos air quality monitor. Again, I'm not saying go out and buy a bunch of this stuff, uh, but I can tell you that my cart works and I, ha I can prove it with those numbers, with that particular meter rather. Uh, it does a really good job of cleaning the air in here. One of the reasons why I think it does a good job, obviously there's a lot of surface area for the filters, but the exhaust on that is right at the floor and it blows up at a 45 degree angle. So now if you put it up against the wall, not only are you gonna circulate, uh, circulate air this way, but you're also circulating air top to bottom, putting the clean, fresher air up top and the heavier, dustier air down to be sucked up into the filters. So I think that does a really good job. And shortly after I made that, a couple of years after I made that, Axiom came out with their Stratus air cleaner, which has the same concept. It, it, it uh, filters air on the bottom and shoots air straight up. So it has that you know top to bottom circular effect. And I think that does a really good job of cleaning the air. So clean the air by, uh, by uh, collecting the dust right at the source, by ambiently just cleaning the air as well. And then also you wanna protect it from going into your lungs. It's the super fine stuff that your, your lungs can't really filter out. And you do that by wearing a mask. Now, once again, we're in this whole COVID situation. So uh, masks are, a hot topic for various different reasons and they're kind of hard to find really good masks are, for woodworking are kind of hard to find everywhere but i did find a good reliable source that has these available for woodworkers so if you just just haven't been able to find a, a good respirator and you need one finally we do have a good woodworking source respirators right this i've got two that i've had for quite a while and these are reusable you can clean the insides all this silicone plastic, whatever this is, you can, you can get this nice and clean and just change out the filters. Uh, so these will last you a really long time. These are the 6000 series. This is the 6200, 3M 6200, which is medium size. And if I shave all my, my facial hair, this will have a good, nice seal on my face because I keep some facial hair. I have to use a large 
and uh, the large allows me to be able to cinch it down a little bit tighter and get a good seal. And just thinking you have a good seal isn't necessarily um, isn't necessarily the best advice. You want to make sure you do have a good seal. So 3M has a again I'll have a uh, I'll have it linked in the resources. 3M has a PDF that you can look at to test the seal on your face. And basically you push it up to your face really good. I'm not going to do it because you won't be able to hear me, but you push it up to your face really good, close off the air supply with your hands, and gently inhale. And if you inhale and it sucks to your face, then you have a good seal. If you inhale and it's not sucking into your face at all, then you got some type of um, leak somewhere around there. So not only wearing one, but actually you know test it to make sure you got a good seal. Uh, which is one of the reasons why I don't particularly care for like those disposable dust dust masks. Yeah, they, they work a little bit, I guess. They, they, they wouldn't make them. But I can never get a good seal around my face. I just don't trust that seal. So I don't have any disposable dust masks. I just have multiple respirators that I can use. I've got two of these. So I can wear one. Someone else can wear one. Uh, so long as it's clean before they, they wear it. Uh, but if there's a bunch of people in the shop, I'm just not going to create a dangerous situation that requires one of these as far as uh, spraying finishes or getting the shop super, super dusty. Now, one thing about these is there's two different types of filters. There is a canister filter like this. I think they're called canister filters. This is for organic vapors. This is the harmful smelling chemicals that you don't want to smell. Like if you heard someone saying they got high on paint fumes, right? That's not a good thing. Uh, this will protect you from like lacquers and, and harmful stuff that you don't want to breathe in. You don't want to breathe the chemicals in, but you want to still also protect yourself from the, the dust, the particulates. So there's a organic vapor and then there's a, where'd it go? This one. These are the particulate filters. So these will get um, the dust stop you from breathing in dust. So if the if the shop gets really really dusty in here Which I will monitor with that if that thing goes over about a hundred or so on the large or small particle count We'll kind of stop let the air cleaner cart catch up with stuff Maybe we'll take a break outside or something like that But I don't like to work in here in a really really dusty air environment where other people are not protected If it's if it's just me uh, I can put one of these on and be fine But I don't have enough of these for everybody so what if you're working in a dusty environment that also has organic fumes that you don't want to breathe. Well, that's where you go back to this one, but you add a pre-filter onto the front of these. So I'll get into that in just a second, but these, these two ones I've had for many years, cleaned them out many times. Um, this one's mine, no one else uses it. Oh, real quick, one thing to note. This one is the 6503 from uh, 3M, and it has this feature here that you lift up and it releases the tension. So if it's on your face and you lift it up, it drops to right here so you can talk. And I bought this because of this specific feature. I thought being able to pop this down and talk would be a really handy thing. But if you're wearing this and you need to talk, you don't need to put the mask down because then you're not getting the protection of this. So it never made any sense to actually use it. So because of that, and not only, I mean, if you push this up to your face, your sound is muffled, but you can still get your point across. So it's just inconvenient to pop this down because then you have something under your chin and it's just it's just so annoying. So this particular feature, I think it's pointless. Um, I wouldn't, I don't know if there's a price difference on getting this particular feature, but I wouldn't spend the extra money if I had to do it over again. That being said, these are really good respirators uh, and I just found another source. So I picked up two more. This one is a medium that I will keep in this sealed bag until somebody with a medium face needs to use it. It does not come with filters on it. So I'll get into that in just a second. And then this one, where did you go? Where did you go? This one over here is the new large for me. This is the 6300 and just a regular large without that little flip up doohickey. Uh, these filters attach pretty securely. There's a three sided connection point. So you can, you can customize the filters based upon your environment. For woodworking, you basically, you're only gonna use for the most part, a particulate filter. This is a P100, meaning it's not 100% effective. It's like 99.98% effective against particles. I believe less than three microns. I think, don't quote me on that, but this is the the, the uh, general go-to particle filter for woodworking type stuff. And it just clips on and spins and you're good to go. Again, if you're using fumes or you're doing something with fumes, then you wanna have these cartridges. Again, same attachment point. Spins on, flips up. Now, there's one thing with these filters, and that is, how long do they last? 
I had no idea. This th Making this video made me look into that. How long do, or preparing for this video rather, how long do these last? And I was shocked to find out that how little lifespan these are actually rated for. So I found on their, I'm fumbling around with papers now. Found on their website, 3M, they have a little printable stuff for basically everything. And one of their, their uh, pages on these respirators says, when do I replace my 3M particulate filters? When it becomes either A, difficult to breathe comfortably, this may vary from individual to individual because they get clogged up, or B, the filter becomes dirty or physically damaged, then you replace it. All right, that's all fine and dandy. What about these cartridges? What about these organic vapor cartridges? When do you replace them? On that one, it says gas and vapor cartridge filters replace both of those when the exp expiry date stamped on the sealed packet has elapsed. And I just looked at mine, way out of date. Once opened, the maximum time is about six months, even if not used. And I wonder why. Well, because the carbon will absorb the contaminants from the general environment. So that makes you wonder. If, if, the, if, the envir if the lifespan is literally only six months because it's going to absorb, can we stretch these a little bit further by storing them just like they package them? Store them in a good quality Ziploc package. Will that extend the life of them? I don't know, I'm gonna experiment with that. But in the meantime, I found another solution that's even better uh, than guessing, and that is these, these new filters have a lifespan bar on them. I've never seen this before, which is really cool. So I can't speak to how long they're gonna last or how well they're gonna perform, but this particular style, this is the 6001i cartridge, come on now, has a little flap that you can peel back and it's a sticky back so you can replace it or so you can push it back uh, and not have this gauge damaged. But you see, almost looks like a solar panel right there, right there. That is a, a little gauge that will change over time to let you know the lifespan of the cartridge. Really cool, I've never seen that before. The manual, it tells you how to read that gauge. It's basically a line that comes all the way down. See, there's a little warning here, it says, hey, caution, dummy, read the manual. Hey, dummy, read the manual. <laughs> anyway, so these, these are the cartridges that I'm gonna get from going forward because it'll actually let me know when they when they expire because you know if not you may end up like me thinking that you're protected with my last pair that expired in 2016 that's horrible to even admit 2016 but i don't know you put this on you don't smell lacquer fumes still crazy to think about not knowing when these things expire uh, it's crazy to think about. So going forward, I will have good protection with this. But also I wanted to mention the organic vapors. What if you're in an environment that's dusty and you also need uh, vapor protection? Well, for those, they have P95 or N95. Yeah, these are N95 particulate pre-filters that go on here. Just picked up another box because I've had this one for quite a while. And as you can see, I'm getting low on it. So I did use these with the filters and it's just this little filter. Yeah, but you have to also get these caps. So the filter goes inside this cap and then it clips on top of the, if I do this the right way, filter goes on top of the cap and then the cap clips onto the cartridge and has a nice seal all the way around and it has only this opening here. So the air you breathe in is forced to go through this filter and then the organic vapor cartridge. So you get the best of both worlds but you have to get all these separately. You have to get the cartridge, you have to get the cap, you have to get the, the other filter, and of course, just the, the other filters here. So it sounds like a lot, but protect your lungs because uh, if you can't breathe, you can't breathe. Uh, my father-in-law passed away of COPD and not being able to breathe is kind of something not really fun to look at. It's a horrible, horrible situation. Where's my list? What's next? Next up is first aid. And first aid is really one of those places where you want to take a deep dive here. And I, and I hope that uh, we can find this. Hopefully I can provide that article from Fine Woodworking because it's from an ER nurse and some stuff that it's just really good information for, for woodworking specific. So also before I made this video, I uh, asked a friend of mine, my, my neighbor at my last house was or is an ER nurse at our local hospital. I said, hey, what type of stuff that you, do you see in the ER that is woodworking related? Like what's the first thing that pops up that you see? What's most common? 
and he said most common is either table saw accidents or circular saw accidents. He didn't kind of elaborate on either one of those other than amputations or partial amputations. But a circular saw, uh, I know I'm guilty of in the past pinning the guard open and you, you can get kicked back and it can kick back into your leg and you have this big gash. Horrible woodworking event. Don't pin the guard open. Luckily, I've never seen that, witnessed it or anything, but I am guilty of pinning the guard back in years past. And then of course the table saw. We all know what the table saw and the band saw can do with amputations and cutting fingers off. Uh, so take that into consideration when you start building your, your safety kit, right? In my first aid kit here in the shop, I've got just a basic first aid kit and inside one of these, you're always gonna have the simple stuff like band-aids, uh, sterile bandages, um, cold packs. I took the cold pack out of here. One of those activated cold packs where you mash it up and it turns really, really cold. I took that out of here and I'll tell you why in just a second. I put it in something else. And then also, most of these come with a really crappy set of tweezers. I mean, I guess you could pick up a pencil with this. These tweezers suck. The point, there, there's no point on the end of these. You know, it comes with them, but whatever. So there's a couple areas for improvement, but you still have your basic stuff like medical tape and sterile bandages, bandages, just the basic stuff, right? I've got a couple of these, keep one in my truck as well. But something I also keep in my truck and here in the shop is a tourniquet pack. So these particular tourniquets, uh, I, they're, not a, they're not that cheap. I think they're like 15, 20 bucks each. And you buy them in bulk or you buy a few of them, uh, you'll save money individually. And you're thinking like, why do you need a bulk pack of tourniquets? What's going on in there, right? Well, uh, I bought a five pack of these tourniquets and I keep one here in the shop in this bag, which I'll get into. I keep one in the glove box of all my vehicles because if you drive around, you witness an accident, this could save somebody's life. And I also keep one in my shooting range bag, my IFAC, individual first aid kit that goes with me to the shooting range. So these are really cool tourniquets in that they're really, really highly recommended. I asked a couple people in the military and they, they sent one of the, they sent me links to this one, both of them did. They're Velcro, right? So they, I'm not gonna, this isn't a demonstration by any means, uh, but it, you know what a tourniquet does, it just clamps off blood supply. So you can pull this really, really tight and then the Velcro kind of holds it there and then you can take that a step further and this bar has the elastic going through it or the, uh, the um, nylon going through it and then you twist it to really, really clamp down and tighten the seal. So this is your first tighten, and then you really tighten it with that. Um, this isn't a demonstration by any means, so uh, get, some, get some good training on one of these, some proper training. But a tourniquet, you know, I don't ever wanna see a limb or anything crazy going on in this shop, but I wanna be prepared. So this uh, is all in this nice little pack. There's also a sterile bag in here but I took the cold pack on my first aid kit and put it inside of a Ziploc bag with the original bag inside there as well. And then this goes in it. So all three of these stay together. Reason being is whatever gets cut off, if it can fit inside that bag, I wanna throw the, the body part with that bag into this Ziploc bag. It'll fit with this cold pack going and uh, all that good stuff. Again, this is kind of a crazy situation that you hope never happens, but hey man, I want to be prepared. Uh, that's part of the first aid kit that I have here in the shop. And then one of the most used by far first aid kit things is in this little envelope. And I keep it in this envelope because it's tiny and I can see this more so than I can see what's in it. This is the Uncle Bill's Sliver Gripper. The very best tweezers, in my opinion, ever invented for getting a sliver out. So these are amazing. All right, it's a two-piece system. This is your tweezers over here. Clamp, uh, you push it down to get it out of the clip. And then you have a very sharp, nice, pokey, direct set of tweezers that you can dig basically anything out of. This is, uh, this is really good. And of course, to, to keep them from, these pokies from stabbing anything, there's this little holder that you pinch this down, slide it into it, and it expands onto this clip and the points are protected underneath that little tab and there's a little hole. So if you wanna hang it on a nail or something, you can do that. But this is so tiny and it's so valuable in my shop that I just leave it in this little white thing. If you get anything for safety, <laughs> you're gonna use these all the time. I use them all the time. Just general discussion here on fire safety. I'm not a firefighter, but my neighbor is. So when I moved into this shop, I picked his brain. I said, hey man, you wanna come out to my shop and just 
you know, let's talk about fire safety for, for a minute or so. Uh, he, he did, and he said, basically, here's the thing. In your shop, you want an ABC fire extinguisher, so those can cut out, uh, they, those can put out all the different types of fires. You want an ABC fire extinguisher, and for this size shop, you basically need a 10-pound fire extinguisher. And he said, you really only need one fire extinguisher that's easily accessible, but a 10 pound is basically all you need. And when I'm thinking fire safety, I'm thinking, yeah, but I wanna have like 15 of them and I wanna have, you know, something that's like 10 pounds, uh -uh, I want like a 50 pound fire extinguisher, right? And he said, well, you know, it sounds great to have even more protection, but if, if you can't put out a fire with a 10 pound fire extinguisher, you, need, you just need to get out. And I thought, oh yeah, that's, that's probably the best advice as far as fire safety. If, fire, you know, putting out a fire. If, if you can't put it out, get out, right? So uh, with that being said, uh, I do have four fire extinguishers in here and it wasn't because of, you know, wanting, wanting more, more, more. In my last shop, it was a two car garage and there was a bunch of stuff in the way of, of, of the, you know, a nice walking egress, which is kind of not that great. So I had two fire extinguishers in my last shop. It was a 20 foot by 20 foot two car garage and I had this hand right there. That one on the miter saw station, that is a four pound fire extinguisher. I bought two of those. I put one on the miter saw station and one right by the door entrance into my house. So right when you walk through the door, if you see something crazy, you can grab the fire extinguisher and try and put it out. Also, if you're at the, if you're working in the shop, that, that particular one right there <laughs> was somewhat readily accessible. So those I carried over from my last shop. They worked just fine in my last shop. Uh, well, I never used them, but they're, they're not, they're not defective, they're not depreciating by any means, so I can still use them here in this shop. But, he said, get a 10 pound and you, that should be it, right? And I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna go find a 10 pound fire extinguisher. So one of these is a 10 pound fire extinguisher that I bought, it's an ABC. Uh, an ABC fire extinguisher means A is trash, wood, paper, stuff like that that'll catch fire. B, liquids, which is gasoline type, you know, flammable liquids, or C, electrical equipment, so ABC. All of these are ABC fire extinguishers. So anyway, I went out and I uh, bought a 10 pounder and then like, ba I think it was like real close to the same day that, that, that I got mine, he showed up with one and said, hey, I bought you a fire extinguisher. I was like, you're an awesome neighbor. I very much appreciate that. So now I've got a bunch of fire extinguishers. So what do you do with four fire extinguishers and a 30 foot by 40 foot, 30 foot by 40 foot shop? You equally spread them out. I've got this one on this back wall. Uh, the other short one goes opposite of it on the, the other wall. And then somewhere near the each end is one of the is one of the big fire extinguishers. So his recommendation, a firefighter's recommendation for my shop was just a single 10 pound unit. And I've got a little bit of redundancy, a little bit of easy access to all of those. Fire extinguishers are great for putting out fires, but what about actually creating one? You don't want to create a fire, obviously. Uh, so there's a couple things to think about with, as far as like oily rags, if you're using um, oils on, on finishes, certain oils, certain chemicals are known to spontaneously combust on rags. So depending on where you live, you might be actually, you might actually be required to put those used rags in some type of metal fireproof container of some kind. Take that into consideration if that's where, if, if you live in a you know, a densely populated area, you might be subject to certain code restrictions. I've heard of people just walking outside and throwing them in their fire bin or a burn bin for the next time that they light a fire. You know, uh, just try to, just, just get rid of the oily rags out of the shop, put them in a safe environment. In my last shop, I didn't really burn anything, but what I did was I set up a, um, like a metal roller stand or something. I had something that was metal and I put, draped the rag over it and stuck it in an area that wasn't near any type of flammable stuff. So I let it air dry completely before I threw it out. I don't know if that was the best thing to do, but hey, that's what I did. It, also, some of your tools are, are a little bit more prone to, or not prone, are a little bit more capable of starting a fire. A CNC machine, right? When I worked at Ashley Furniture in the frame mill, a bunch of CNC machines running, sometimes a little program would go a little haywire and the bit would just plunge into the wood while it's still spinning and just sit there. And what does a, a spinning bit shoved into a, a, a section of wood do? It creates a fire and it creates it pretty fast. So if any one of you guys out there has a CNC machine, I strongly recommend keeping a fire extinguisher nearby. Hopefully you never use it. But if that bit gets plumage, plunged down in there while you're doing something else, still within eyesight of the machine, you may be able to get over there and stop it in time, but a fire may have already started. So. A CNC machine, uh, a fire extinguisher is a must with a CNC machine. Also, dust collection system. If you use PVC for your dust collection system, there is a long-standing myth 
that you're going to, one spark is going to just blow up your house and your shop. Uh, there's an article that I always like to link to that uh, breaks down what's actually needed to, cr to create a combustible atmosphere inside your dust collection system. Uh, I think it's like the wood, the woodnerd.com, if I'm not mistaken, but he breaks down the wood explosion myth due to dust collection systems. And basically, every one of us who's in a hobby type shop who doesn't have this big, massive industrial type setting, it's nearly impossible, nearly impossible to create. The, the just the right formula of dust and air for a spark to go boom, right? I, something like you have to you have to sand off a 12 inch by 12 inch by three quarters of an inch of depth material in a super short amount of time just to create a much uh, enough favorable dust. And at that point, all that dust has to be in one certain spot for it to blow up. Paraphrasing here with that article, but I'll link that down below too because grounding a PVC type dust collection system is basically only going to prevent you from getting shocked. I live in a very humid environment. It dries out a little bit here in the shop, but it's still pretty humid. And in my last shop with AC in Mississippi, I never got zapped, ever. Because when I'm working at the machine, I'm working at the machine, not playing with the dust collection system. So at that point, grounding a dust collection system is primarily just for personal not getting zapped convenience. The last thing that I want to talk about on my list is egress and something that I didn't really think about too much until I actually had a decent amount of space to play with. In my last shop, I rearranged tools all the time, moved my layout all the time uh, to try and squeeze efficiency here and there, trying to get a better workflow. And, and the, the case was always justified by like, well, if it doesn't work, just move it back, right? Most everything's on mobile basis. So if it doesn't work, just move it back, no big deal. But oftentimes I would find like, oh, this workflow is, is a little bit better. I'm gaining a little bit here, but I am sacrificing a little bit here. A couple times I moved stuff around and it took me about a week to realize like, oh, this is kind of dangerous. If something happens, I got to go through a maze to get out of here, right? There's not really good egress. I'm making it difficult to escape. So that's something to consider. And in this shop, I took that into mind when I was doing the initial layout. And basically everything is the same since, I'm, since I moved into the shop, other than uh, I recently just rotated my workbench 90 degrees. That's basically it. So uh, it, you've seen probably that side of the workshop over there. I basically just rotated the workbench 90 degrees because I sold my other workbench. Uh, this is the pine one that's staying here. Uh, and I rotated that and then it just, then I just had that moment of like, whoa, that makes a lot of sense for egress and moving around here in the shop. So let me move the camera. I'm actually gonna put the camera in the far back corner all the way up against the wall to kind of see the paths that I have to get out of here in the case that something bad ha actually happening. All right, the camera's basically up against the wall, up against the clamp rack. Uh, on this far corner. And as you can see, if I get out of the way, there is a straight shot all the way to that big door back there. Nothing is in the way, absolutely at all. Uh, I've got my second workbench up against that door because I just sold it and hasn't been picked up yet. But for the most part, it is straight shot all the way to that door. And if I pull you a little bit over here to this other side of the workbench, it is basically the same thing. It's a straight shot all the way to the table saw area, all the way over here, and then it is immediately wide open to this doorway back over here in that corner. There's nice egress, there's nice room for multiple people, including myself, to walk through here. And then if I move you all the way over here to the CNC machine, flip this monitor around so I can actually see what's going on. And again, it's a straight shot all the way to the exits. There's nothing in the way. And let me pull you over to here and go from basically where the camera was when I started. It's a straight shot all the way to the door. Now, a couple things to think about here also, there's egress all the way out these doors, but everything that I put on this wall over here, all this stuff is mobile. It's, it's, it's nothing is permanent over here. Uh, my bikes just happen to be in here today. Um, they're normally not here. This is on a cart. It can be moved out of the way, all that stuff. So th there's a lot of egress out of the shop. Basically, what I'm saying is when I designed the layout here, I knew just from moving around, it made absolutely no sense to put a big stationary machine right in front of the door. That doesn't make any sense. I learned that lesson in the last shop. You want to be able to get in and out of your space very, very, very easily in the event that something crazy happens and you, you got to get out. Back to where we started for the last thing on my outline, and that is areas for improvement. Like I said, one of the goals for this was for me to audit what I've got going on and figure out what I'm doing right, what I'm doing wrong. 
uh, areas for improvement. And uh, as I was going through this, making this outline, there was four <laughs> things that I came up with. Number one, I think I've said this earlier, I don't have any high visibility red cross or anything that says, hey, first aid's right here, buddy. I don't have anything like that here in the shop. I need to make something like that. I don't, I've, I've known that for so long, but why have I not done that yet? No eye wash station. If I get something in my eye, I just go inside, use my bathroom, you know, clean up my eye, whatever I got to do. It doesn't help a lot of other people in here, right? So I need, I need some type of eye wash station. Even if it's just a big bottle of eye, solu eye rinse solution, I still need to have that. I still need to add that to the, uh, to the first aid area. Uh, no dedicated CA glue or medical glue for cuts. One of the things that I really found interesting during all, doing all this research and pre preparation for this video is there's actually a lot of doctors out there that say, hey, use CA glue. It's just fine to, uh, to, to not close, but to keep closed a cut. So if you pinch the cl cut closed and you put CA glue over the top of it, keep it closed, it'll kind of hold it together. Don't open the cut and put CA glue down inside it to kind of don't do that. But CA glue is good to be used for that. So I don't have any CA glue in the shop at all, right, as it happens to be right now. So adding some small little disposable one-time use CA glue packs or two-time use CA glue pass packs to the first aid kit, that would be a good idea. And then also along those same lines, uh, I found some skin closure clips, skin closure strips. It's basically like tape that is made to uh, help keep the, a wound closed so if it's not too crazy right doesn't it's not requiring stitches or something uh, but just if you keep bugging it and it won't stay closed you can kind of push it together and put a skin closure strip basically a sterile piece of tape over the top of it and that'll supposedly help i haven't tried that but uh, it's something that i do want to pick up i think that's it i feel like i'm losing my voice i've talked a lot i ramble a lot if you have anything to add to this conversation, it is a conversation. It's not just me talking. I want you guys to participate as well. If you have something to add, leave a comment. If you're watching this on one of the video platforms, leave a comment. If you're watching this on my website, leave a comment. If you think that you can help somebody, leave a comment because odds are you don't know it, but you have already helped somebody by doing so. Uh, there's a lot of little gems inside YouTube comments uh, for various different videos or whatever, but uh, you never know. You could potentially help somebody. That's it for this video. You guys take care. Have a great day and I'll talk to you in the next video.